Hi, this is Kim Droptini, and I'm here to read chapter two of Intramuros by Rebecca Springer. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say I this is new to me to go live. Um, so please forgive any mistakes. I've just decided to um, go ahead and do this live and um, hope that I can get through it without mistakes or interruptions. So without further ado, here is chapter two of Intramuros. O oh, city of peace in thy palaces fair, loved faces and forms we can see, and sweet voices float to us through the calm air that whisper, we're watching for thee. We walked on for some distance in silence, my heart wrestling with the thoughts of the new strange life my eyes drinking in fresh beauty at every step. The houses, as we approached and passed them, seemed wondrously beautiful to me. They were built of the finest marbles, encircled by broad verandas, the roofs or domes supported by massive or delicate pillars or columns, and winding steps led down to the pearl and golden walks. The style of the architecture was unlike anything I had ever seen, and the flowers and vines that grew luxuriantly everywhere surpassed in beauty, even those of my brightest dreams. <laughs> happy faces looked out from these columned walls, and happy voices rang upon the clear air from many a celestial home. Frank, where are we going? At length I asked. Home, little sister. He answered tenderly, home? Have we a home, my brother? Is it anything like these? I asked with a wild desire in my heart to cry out for joy. Come and see, was his only answer as he turned into a side path leading toward an exquisitely beautiful house whose columns of light gray marble shone through the green of the overhanging trees with most inviting beauty. Before I could join him, I heard a well-remembered voice saying close beside me, I just had to be the first to bid you welcome. And looking around, I saw the dearly beloved face of my old time friend, Mrs. Wickham. Oh, oh, I cried as we met in a warm embrace. You will forgive me, Colonel Sprague, she said a moment later, giving her hand cordially to my brother. It seems unpardonable to intercept you thus in almost the first hour, but I heard that she was coming and I could not wait. But now that I've looked upon her face and heard her dear voice, I will be patient till I can have her for a long, long talk. You must come in and see her now, said my brother cordially. Do, do come, I urged. No, dear friends, not now. You know, Dear little Blossom, the old pet name for me years ago, we have all eternity before us, but you will bring her to me soon, Colonel Sprague, she said. Just as soon as I may, dear madam, he replied, with an expressive look in her eyes. Yes, I understand, she said softly, with a sympathetic glance at me. Then with a warm hand clasp and the parting injunction, come very soon. She passed swiftly out of my sight. Blessed woman, I said, what a joy to meet her again. Her home is not far away. You can see her often. She is indeed a lovely woman. Now come, little sister. I long to give you welcome to our home. Saying which, he took my hand and led me up the low steps onto the broad veranda with its beautiful inlaid floor of rare and costly marbles and its massive columns of gray, between which vines covered with rich glossy leaves of green were intermingled with flowers of exquisite color and delicate perfume hanging in heavy festoons. We paused for a moment here that I might see the charming view presented on every side. It's heavenly, I said. It is heavenly, he answered. It could not be otherwise. I smiled my acknowledgement of this truth. My heart was too full for words. 
The entire house, both below and above, is surrounded by these broad verandas, but come within. He led me through a doorway between the marble columns into a large reception hall, whose inlaid floor, mullion window, and broad low staircase at the far end at once held my fancy. Before I could speak, my brother turned to me and taking both my hands said, Welcome, a thousand welcomes, dearest sister, to your heavenly home. Is this beautiful place indeed to be my home? I asked as well as my emotion would allow. Yes, dear, he replied. I built it for you and my brother, and I assure you it has been a labor of love. It is your home? And I am to stay with you? I said a little confused. No, it is your home, and I am to stay with you till my brother arrives. Always, dear brother, always, I cried, clinging to his arm. He smiled and said, we will enjoy the present. We never will be far apart again. But come, I am eager to show you all. Turning to the left, he led me, still through the beautiful marble columns that everywhere seemed to substitute it for doorways, into a large oblong room upon whose threshold I stopped in wondering delight. The entire walls and floor of the room were still of that exquisite light gray marble, polished to the greatest luster, but over walls and floors were strewn exquisite, long-stemmed roses of every variety and color, from the deepest crimson to the most delicate shades of pink and yellow. Come inside, said my brother. I do not want to crush those perfect flowers, I answered. Well then, suppose we gather some of them. I stooped to take one from the floor close to my feet, when lo, I found it was embedded in the marble. I tried another, with the same astonishing result. Then turning to my brother, I said, what does it mean? You surely do not tell me that none of these are natural flowers? He nodded his head with a pleased smile and said, This room has a history. Come in and sit with me here upon this window seat where you can see the whole room and let me tell you about it. I did as he desired and he continued. One day as I was busily working upon the house, a company of young people Boys and girls came to the door and asked if they might enter. I gladly gave assent, and then one of them said, Is this house really for Mr. and Mrs. Sprague? It is, I answered. We used to know and love them. They are our friends and the friends of our parents, and we want to know if we may not do something to help you make it beautiful. Indeed you may, I said, touched by the request. What can you do? We were here at the time and looking about, one of them asked, may we beautify this room? Undoubtedly, I said, wondering what they would try to do. All at once, the girls, all of whom had immense bunches of roses in their hands, began to throw the flowers broadcast over the floor and against the walls. Whatever they stuck the walls, they, to even my surprise, remained as though in some way permanently attached. When the roses had all been scattered, the room looked just as it does now, only the flowers were really fresh gathered roses. Then the boys each produced a small case of delicate tools, and in a moment all, boys and girls, were down upon the marble floor and busy at work. How they did it, I do not know. It is one of the celestial arts, taught to those of highly artistic tastes, but they embedded each living flower just where and as it had fallen in the marble and preserved it as you see before you. They came several times before the work was completed, for the flowers do not wither here nor fade, but, but were always fresh and perfect. And such a merry, happy company of young people I never saw before. They laughed and chatted and sang as they worked, and I could not help wishing more than once that the friends whom they had left mourning for them might look in upon this happy group and see how little cause they had for sorrow. At last, when all was complete, they called me to see their work, and I was not chary of my praises either for the beauty of the work or for their skill in performing it. Then, saying they were 
they would be sure to return when either of you came. They went away together to do something of the kind elsewhere. I doubt not. Happy tears had been dropping upon my hands, clasped idly in my lap during much of this narrative. And now I asked half brokenly, for I was greatly touched. Who were these lovely people, Frank? Do you know them? Of course, I know them now, but they were all strangers till me, to me till they came here that first morning, except Lulu Sprague. Who are they? There were three Marys, Mary Green, Mary Bates, Mary Chalmers, Lulu Sprague, and May Camden. These were the girls, each lovely and beautiful. The boys, all manly, fine fellows, were Carol Ashland, Stanley, and David Chalmers. Precious children, I said. How little I thought my love for them in the olden days would ever bring to me this added happiness here. How little we know of the links binding the two worlds. Ah, yes, said my brother. That is just it. How little we know. If only we would realize while we are yet mortals that day by day we are building for eternity, how different our lives in many ways would be. Every gentle word, every generous thought, every unselfish deed will become a pillar of eternal beauty in the life to come. We cannot be selfish and unloving in one life and generous and loving in the next. The two lives are too closely blended, one but a continuation of the other. But come now to the library. Rising, we cross the room that henceforward was to hold for me such tender associations and entered the library. It was a glorious apartment, the walls lined from ceiling to floor with rare and costly books. A large stained glass window opened upon the front veranda and two large bow windows not far apart were in the back of the room. A semicircular row of shelves supported by very delicate pillars of gray marble about six feet high, extended some 15 feet into the spacious main room and cut it into two sections lengthwise, each with one of the bowed windows in the back, leaving still a large space beyond the dividing line where two sections united again into one. The concave side of the semicircle of shelves was more toward the entrance of the room and close to it, not far removed from the bowed window, stood a beautiful writing desk with everything ready for use, and upon it was a chaste golden bowl filled with scarlet carnations of whose spicy order, odor I had been dimly conscious for some time. My brother's desk, said Frank, and his favorite flowers, I added. Yes, that follows. Here we never forget the tastes and preferences of those we love. It is not to be supposed that these details were at once noticed by me, but they unfolded to me gradually as we lingered talking together. My first sensation upon entering the room was genuine surprise at the sight of the books, and my first words were, why, we have books in heaven? Why not, asked my brother. What strange ideas we mortals have of the pleasures and duties of this blessed life. We seem to think that death of the body means an entire change to the soul, but that is not the case by any means. We bring to this life the same tastes, the same desires, the same knowledge we had before death. If these were not sufficiently pure and good to form a part of this life, then we ourselves may not enter. What would be the use of our oft times long lives given to the pursuit of certain worthy and legitimate knowledge, if at death it all counts as nothing, and we begin this life on a wholly different line of thought and study. No, no, would that all could understand, as I said before, that we are building for eternity during our earthly life. The purer the thoughts, the nobler the ambitions, the loftier the aspirations, the higher the rank we take among the hosts of heaven the more earnestly we follow the studies and duties in our life of probation, the better fitted we shall be to carry them forward on and on to completion and perfection here. 
But the books, who writes them? Are any of them books we knew and loved below? Undoubtedly, many of them, all indeed, that in any way help to elevate the human mind or immortal soul. Then, many of the rarest minds in the earth life, upon entering on this higher life, gain such elevated and extended views of the subjects that have been with them lifelong studies that, pursuing them with zest, they write out for the benefit of those less gifted, the higher, stronger views they have themselves acquired, thus remaining leaders and teachers in this rare life as they were while yet in the world. Is it to be expected that the great soul who has so recently joined our ranks, whose change life in Pax Vobisicum uplifted so many lives while on earth, should lay his pen aside when his clear brain and great heart have read the mystery of the higher knowledge? Not so. When he has conned his lessons well, he will write them out for the benefit of others, less gifted, who must follow. Leaders there must always be, in this divine life as in the former life. Leaders and teachers in many varied thoughts, lines of thought. But all this knowledge will come to you simply and naturally as you grow into the new life. End of chapter two. I hope you enjoyed this reading and I hope to put chapter three up in a couple of days, if not tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, please subscribe and share this with anybody you know. God bless.